The Christian in Complete Armor by William Grinnell. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18, chapter 49. Examination of the end we propound in this duty. First, examine thy soul and see what end thou propoundest to thyself in extraordinary prayer. None but a child or a fool will run before he knows what is his errand. The end is that which a wise man looks to before he sets his hand to any work. And the more weighty the enterprise is, the more necessary this is. First, consider, if the end thou propoundest be evil, the duty cannot be good, because thy heart is not sincere in it. The sincerity of the heart discovers itself in the end it aims at in a duty, not in the external performancy of it. The thief and the honest traveler may be found riding in the same road, and they have different aims therein. Thus the saint and the hypocrite join in the same duty, shoot as it were in the same bow, but their eye takes not the same aim, and therefore their arrows meet not in the same point. The prayers of the one are rejected as abominable, and the other graciously accepted. Who were more seemingly devout than the captive Jews that kept up a fast for seventy years together? Yet God gave them but little thanks because their end was not right. Zechariah chapter 7, verse 5. Wherein ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even though seventy years did ye at all fast unto me, even unto me. A faster a man rides, if he be in the wrong road, the further he goes out of his way. Zeal is the best or worst thing in a duty. If the end be right, it is excellent, but if wrong, it is worthless, and it is no easy thing to propound a right end. The eye must be set right in the head before it can look right. A false heart, and every carnal heart as such, cannot have a true end. Secondly, consider that your endeavor in the duty will hear proportion and be commensurated to the end you propound therein. If your end be low, your endeavor will be no more than to reach that end. As he that intends to build a little cottage contends himself with ordinary stuff, but he that designs such stately palace provides more precious materials. Thus David was very particular in the materials he laid aside for the temple. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Therefore he prepared with all his might gold and silver, etc. First Chronicles 29, verses 1-3 through three. The hypocrite's ends in a fast are low and base. His credit with men, carnal profit and the like, accordingly his endeavor is laid out on the external part of the duty. A denure countenance, devout posture, and such expressions in prayer as may most take with those that hear him, and that is all he looks at. But the gracious soul saith with David, This palace which I build, this duty which I perform, is not for man, but for the Lord God, and therefore his chief care is to provide more precious materials, a broken heart for sin in his confessions, faith and feverancy in his petitions, love and thankfulness in his acknowledgments of mercies received. But when is an evil end propounded in this duty? The end we propound may be evil, either in, in, intrinsically, when the thing we aim at is evil in its own nature, or else from some irregularity in placing it too high or low in our aim. First, we shall name two ends that are intrinsically evil. First, when a person or a people shall fast and pray to cover and more slightly carry on any wicked enterprise. This is a horrid evil, a monstrous abomination. Yet such deep hypocrisy hath the heart of man discovered, and it dare come and lay its cacatrice egg under the very wing of God and make use of this his solemn ordinancy as an expedient to hatch their wicked designs. The fox, they say, when hard put to it, will, to save himself, fall in among the dogs, and hunt among them as one of the company. Thus the hypocrite, the better to conceal his wicked projects, will run among the saints, and make as loud a cry as the best of them all. 
It is the devil's old trick, and he hath learned it his instruments to wrap up wicked plots in the gilded covers of God's ordinances. What plotting and counterplotting, what was there between Sikkim the son of Hamor and Simon and Levi, the expedient which both used to accomplish their designs was an ordinance of God, the one hopes by submitting to it to get possession of the whole estate of Jacob's family. Shall not their substance be ours? And the other persuades them to it that when they were sore they might plunder them without resistancy. Absalom, that he may the better play the traitor against his father, begs leave to pay his vow at Hebron. Jezebel sets her trap for Naboth, and that he may the more surely fall into her clutches, she crouches and humbleth herself even before God in a fast. The demure Pharisees talk much of their fasting, but our Savior was bold to tell them it was to devour the widows' houses, but they devour on earth those morsels that will lie heavy on their stomachs in hell to be digesting to eternity. Thus the hypocrite, like Antichrist, sits in the temple of God, and there commits his excretable abominations, turning a house of prayer into a den of thieves. O tremble at this great wickedness. It gives a crimson tenure to a sin when it is committed under the disguise of religion. Secondly, when a man thinks by fasting and prayer to satisfy God for his sin or merit any favor at his hands, this is a wicked and abominable, and as contrary to the nature of prayer, as buying is to begging. The poor uses entreaties. Proverbs 18.23 When Job resolves on prayer, he renounces any plea taken for his own righteousness. Whom, though... I were righteous, yet would I not answer, but I would make supplication to my judge. Chapter 9, verse 15 We cannot have the benefit of the throne of grace till we quit our legal plea. Christ, indeed, pleads as righteous, and therefore desires what he asks for us as just, because he hath paid for it, but we pray as sinners, and therefore crave all as mercy. Yea, Though we plead Christ's merit, because he is the greatest and freest gift of all others. Yet such is the pride of man's heart that he had rather play the merchant and exchange his duties for God's blessing than he thought to receive them gracious. This was the tempter of the carnal Jews. They thought to pacify God for their sin as Jacob, his anger, angry brother, with the droves and flocks of duties which they presented him with, and thought their services undervalued when they were not accepted for good payment. Hence their bold exploitation with the Lord. Wherefore have we fasted, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Isaiah chapter 58, verse 3. Such a high opinion they had of themselves. O oh, take heed of this, pride turns an ordinance into an idol. God accepts our fast and prayers when used for humiliation, but abhors them when we bring them for our justification. The proud Pharisees thought of gaining heaven by their numerous fasts, while the poor publican got the prize by a humble confession of his sin. Luke 18.10 He that thinks of washing his face with muddy water instead of making it clean will leave it dirty. Truly our best tears are not over clean, and can they make us clean that need themselves to be washed? Holy Job does not reply on his purity. If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands ever so clean, yet shalt thou plunge me in the ditch, and my own clothes shall abhor me. For he is not a man as I am, that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. Job chapter 9, verse 30 through 32. Secondly, the end may be, though not intrinsically evil, yet evil from some irregularity, as when we make that our ultimate end, which should only be our subordinate in the duty, the glory of God is to be the ultimate end in every duty or worship, 
and all our common actions also. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. And we certainly should be our utmost end, from whom we receive our beginning. All things are of him, and therefore it is fit they should be to him. The river empties itself into the sea from whence it flows. Now, if we are to have so high an end in our lowest actions, so we ought in our highest, and such our acts of worship, in which we have immediately to do with God, and are thence called priests, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. There are indeed another end for which ordinances are appointed, namely, for the conveyance of all kind of blessings from God unto us. But this is to be subordinate to the former, or else we make the glory of God subservient to our particular good, which we will not endure. Possibly we are in some great affliction. This sets us to pray for deliverance. Thus far we keep on our way, but then we turn aside when our deliverance is more regarded by us than his glory. This is to make use of God that we may enjoy the creature. Whatever we prefer in our desires above the glory of God is an idol worship by us. The heart can engrave as well as the hand, and an idol in the heart is as bad as one set up in the house. But how may I find whether the glory of God or the particular good thing I pray for be that which I make my chief end in duty, first by the carriage of thy heart in duty. If the glory of God be chiefly aimed at, this will give a tenure to the whole duty and influence every part of it. Thou wilt suit thy request to this end, for as there is a secret force among the arm that draws the bow and pressed on the arrow which carries it to the mark aimed at, so there is a secret power which carries the soul out in duty to act suitably to the end he desires to obtain. We will suppose pardon of sin is the mercy that thou prayest for. Now, if thou desirest sincerely the glory of God as well as this mercy, yea, above it, this will direct thee in thy confession of sin to reflect thy soul more than for the honor thou hast by it reflected on God, than the wrath thou hast incurred thyself. So in thy petition thou darest not beg thy pardon on terms that were dishonorable for God to give it, but will desire the mercy in such a way as his glory may be both secured and advanced. Now God cannot pardon the sin of an impertinent wrench that holds still the love of his lust without infinite wrong to his glorious name. Therefore, if his glory be high in the eye, thou wilt cry as earnestly for his sanctifying grace as for pardoning mercy, not merely because thou canst not have pardon without it, but because by it thou shalt be fitted to glorify him. Secondly, it may be discovered by thy carriage after duty in two particulars. First, when the mercy prayed for is obtained. If thou didst chiefly aim at the glory of God in begging it, thy chief care will be to lay it out for his glory. Now thou hast it, whereas he that aimed at himself in praying for it will as little regard God in the using of it as in begging it. It is natural for things to resolve into their principles. The child that Han Hanan obtained of God, she dedicates unto the Lord. Why? Because this was her end in praying for him. First Samuel 1.11, compared with verse 28. When David's prayer is heard, and he delivered, mark his resolve. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Psalms 116, verse 9. Again, O Lord, truly I am thy servant, thou hast loosed my bonds. Verse 16. He returns the mercy to God by improving it for him in a holy life. How can we think he aimed at the glory of God in begging for health that runs away from God as soon as he is set upon his legs, or in praying for wealth that lays it out upon his lust? Secondly, when the thing prayed for is denied, he that aims sincerely at God's glory in prayer for a mercy, I speak now of such mercies as are but conditionally promised, will cheerfully submit to the will of God in a denial, because God can, in such petitions, glorify himself by denying as well as granting them. 
David prayed and fasted for the life of his child. It died notwithstanding. Does this denial make him fall out with God? Is he clamorous and discontented? No. It rises no storm in his heart to hinder him in the service of God. He washes his tears from his cheeks, changes his apparel, and goes che- cheerfully into the house of God and worshipeth. First, Second Samuel 12.20 So powerfully did the will of God determine his will. Thus, as the heavenly bodies are by the uh, premium mobile carried contrary to their particular inclinations, so grace in the saint overrules his natural affections and carries him into compliancy with the will of God when it crosses his own. Our blessed Savior had natural affections, which made him pray that the bitter cup of his passion might, if possible, pass from him. Yet not so, but he was willing to take a denial, and therefore desires his Father to glorify himself, though it were by taking away his life. John chapter 12, verse 27 and 28. Having fixed thy end right, make a diligent search into thy heart and life, whereby thou mayest be enabled more fully and freely to lay open the condition before the Lord. First, for the sins thou hast committed. The great business of a fast lies in the practice of repentancy, and this cannot be done without a narrow scrutiny of the heart. Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. Lamentations 3.40 the thief must be found before he can be tried, and tried before he is condemned and executed. Some sins may be apprehended with little pains, but if thou art true to God in thy own soul, thou wouldest not willingly let any escape. How canst thou expect pardon for any that desirest not justice on all? And how canst thou say thou desirest justice on those sins which thou endeavorest not to apprehend? I do not say that will be able to find all. It is enough. If by thy diligency thou givest proof of any sincerity, that thou wouldest not conceal any. Set thyself therefore in good earnest to the work. Beset thy heart and life round as men would do a wood where murderers are concealed. Hunt back to the several stages of thy life. Bid memory bring in its old records and read over what passages are there written. Call conscience in to dispose what it knows concerning thee, and encourage it to speak freely, and take heed thou dost not check this witness as some correct, corrupt judges do, when they would favor a bad cause or give it secret instructions, as David did Joab, to deal gently with thee. Be willing to have thy condition openly fully, and all thy coverings turned up, for many times foul designs are hid under fair pretenses. Now, when thou hast gone as far as thou canst, begging heaven's help in the thing to tr- search and try thee, whether there be any further wickedness that thou hast not found out, then judge thyself for them with brokenness of heart, justifying God in the sentence denounced against them. God will have thee lay thy neck on the block, though he means not to give the stroke. In a word, labor in thy meditation to give every sin its due weight, and to suffer thy thoughts to dwell on them, till thou findest the fire of thy indignation kindle in thy heart against them. Yea, flame forth into such a holy zeal as makes thee put thyself under an oath to endeavor their utter ruin and destruction. Then thou art fit to beg thy own life, when thou hast vowed the death of thy sins. Secondly, mercy received. Thou hast these, as the least, the most signal instances of them, upon the file, the, unless thou wert a very bad husband for thy soul. If God thinks fit to bottle his saints' tears, they surely should not forget to book his mercies. Now, there are some special seasons wherein the saint should take down this chronicle of God's mercies to read, and this is one, when he is, in, is to engage in this extraordinary duty. First, as the most effectual means to melt his heart for sin. Mercy gives the greatest aggravation to sin, and therefore it 
must needs be the most powerful instrument to break the heart for sin. With this God reproached sinning Israel. Do ye thus request the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Deuteronomy 32, verse 6. They could not have been so evil if God had not been so good to them. When God would break the sore of his people's sin, he compounds a polis with his choicest mercies and lays this warm to their hearts. David had such many months under the lectures of the law, unhumbled for his complicated sin. But Nathan is sent to preach a rehearsal uh, sermon to him of the many mercies that God had graced him with, and while these coals were pouring on his head, his heart dissolved presently. Second Samuel 12:13. The frost is seldom quite out of the earth till the sun hath gotten some power in the spring to dissolve its bands. Neither will hardness of heart be removed until the soul is thoroughly warmed with a sense of God's mercies. There shall be remember your ways and all your doings, wherein ye have been defiled, and ye shall loathe yourselves in your own sight. Ezekiel 20.43 A pardon from the prince hath made some weep, whom the sight of the block could not move. Sight of wrath inflames the conscience, but sense of mercy kindly melts the heart and overcomes the will. Secondly, as a necessary ingredient in all our prayers, let your request be made known with thanksgiving. Philippians 4, six. This spice must be in our all our offerings. He that prays for a mercy he wants and is not thankful for mercy received may seem mindful of himself but is forgetful of God and so takes the right course to shut his prayers out of doors. God will not put his mercies into a rent purse and such is an unthankful heart. Thirdly, thy wants. Before the tradesman goes to the fair, he looks over his shop that he may know what commodity he is most in want of. Thou goest to this duty to furnish thyself with the graces and mercies thou needest. Is it not necessary to see that thy present store is what thy personal and what thy relative needs are? not forgetting the public in whose peace and happiness thou art so much concerned. For if this ship sink, thou canst not be safe in thy private cabin. To leave all these to occur and overtake thee, without charging thy thoughts with them by previous meditation, is too high a presumption for a sober Christian. Besides, thy affections need help as well as thy memory. Nay, we may sooner bring our sins and wants to mind than lay them to heart. It is easier to know them than knowing them to be deeply affected with them, and we do not come in prayer to tell God a bare story of these things, but feelingly and affectionately to make our moan and complaint with deep sighs and groans to Him, who can pardon the one and relieve us in the other. Thirdly, when thou hast upon this scrutiny kindled thy affections by meditation into a deep sense of these things, then flourish, furnish thyself with arguments from the promises to enforce thy prayers and make them prevalent with God. The promises are the ground of faith, and faith, when strengthened, will make thee feverant, and such feverancy ever speeds and returns with victory out of the field of prayer. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5.16 Words in prayer are but as powder. The promise is the bullet that doeth the execution. Faith is the grace that charges the soul with it, and fervency gives it fire and discharges it into God's bosom with such force that the Almighty cannot deny it, because indeed he will not. Now, as he is an impudent soldier that leaves his bullets to be cast till he comes into the field, so is he an unwise Christian that doth not provide and sort promises suitable to his condition and requisite before he engages in so solemn a service. Daniel first searches out the promise, 
what God hath in, engaged to do for his people, as also when the date of this promise expired, and when by meditation he had raised his heart to a firm belief thereof, then he set upon God with a holy violency in prayer, and presses him close, not only as a merciful God, but righteous also, to remember them, now the bond of his promise was coming out. O Lord, ex- according to thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city Jerusalem, etc. Daniel chapter 9, verse 16. The mightier anyone is in the word, the more mighty he will be in prayer. End of chapter 49.